much for inviting me here. Um, so in fact, I hope this talk is not going to be either too simple for some of you or too specialized for others. Uh, so here is an uh, outline and also motivation. Um, so I'm going to discuss the interface between analytical and numerical relativity computations, um, trying basically to model the dynamics and the gravitational wave emission with different goals. Um, one goal is um, understanding gravity in the weak and strong regime, which means also to compare with post-Newtonian theory uh, to interpret the transition in spiral to merger to ring down, um, to dig out the nonlinearities. And uh, another important goal uh, is to use this uh, interface to build uh, uh, good templates that can be used either for detecting gravitational waves or to extract uh, uh, parameters. And we will see, in fact, that the, the, the level of accuracy that is required either to detect or to estimate parameters is different. And finally, we would like also to use this modeling to uh, make more uh, robust astrophysical predictions. For example, uh, uh, the recoil velocity of merging black holes and this is an interesting uh, uh, subject because um, uh, it affects also the way in which, uh, for example, supermassive black holes have formed in the history of the universe and event rates for merger supermassive black holes of interest, for example, for, uh, for LISA. So here, so the idea is to uh, solve the so-called two-body problem in general relativity, which means to solve the Einstein field equations that I wrote it down here for a binary black hole system for which T mu nu is going to be in fact zero. And uh, uh, to compute also the radiation field far from the source. And uh, in the last uh, 30 years, this problem has been tackled either using analytical tools through some approximation schemes. For example, you assume that one of the two bodies is much smaller than the other one. Or you assume that the two bodies are very far, so far apart that uh, uh, you can um, uh, do an expansion in uh, the, speed, the relative speed of the two bodies with respect to the speed of light. So this is a slow motion approximation, V over C. Or you can also um, have, in fact, an expansion in the Newton constant G. And in fact, sometimes these two expansions are intertwined between uh, uh, them, and we will see that. And on the other hand, uh, the best way of solving uh, uh, the two-body problem, especially during the last phase of the evolution, when the two-body uh, coalesce, merge, and uh, a new black hole is formed, is to use numerical relativity, which means to solve this equation to extract the, uh, for the metric, uh, g mu nu, and these are 10 coupled nonlinear differential equations. They, are, um, they depend on four space-time coordinates. You have to fix a gauge, a coordinate system, etc. So um, I will. Uh, so during the talk, uh, I will start actually with something rather simple, which is uh, uh, a test particle in a Schwarzschild space-time. Uh, just to remind you, results that were obtained long time ago in the 70s, where people were trying to solve this problem of a test particle in uh, Schwarzschild, uh, either numerically or analytically. And then we will uh, discuss some uh, analytical uh, uh, results for the in spiral uh, and for the ring down part. And well, I will then present uh, some numerical relativity results and then combine the two together for two main uh, subjects, uh, the building of templates uh, for, uh, for LIGO and then at the end uh, the uh, recoil velocity. Uh, so here I want just to remind something that, uh, and I, I want to do it because you will see some of these concepts will come back also in the case in which the two black holes have comparable mass. So since the pioneering work of uh, Reg and Wheeler in 57 and then of Zerilli, um, uh, so those people work out uh, the uh, perturbations um, in a Schwarzschild uh, um, background and the perturbations uh, satisfy a very simple equation at the end, uh, in the case of a Schwarzschild background. 
So uh, the L here is the perturbation, is second derivative with respect to a uh, uh, coordinate here, which is uh, um, R star, is just the tortoise coordinate in Schwarzschild. And um, on the right hand side of this equation, you, have, uh, you can have a source, for example, it could be a test particle in Schwarzschild. And here you see there is the, uh, this potential here, which is called the effective potential of the curvature potential. And because I'm in the Fourier domain, uh, this is the frequency uh, associated to the perturbation. So in the 70s, uh, uh, all these people tried to solve this equation numerically. And they found uh, results that were um, quite interesting. So for example, in the case of a radial infall, the outgoing field um, uh, radiation field uh, has this uh, particular shape and they identified here, by the way here this is the field as a function of the retarded time, there is uh, um, a, they call it the precursor pulse and then you have uh, here a very uh, a sharp uh, burst and then this part here it's a tail, wave tail uh, with a particular wavelength which is proportional to this square root of 27. And you will see in a moment why there is this number here. Now if you try to, to understand how this uh, uh, radiation field is emitted considering the shape of the potential that appears here, also this is plotted as a function of the retarded time, and on top of this there are this position R which is the position of the test particle going toward the black hole. And what happens is that uh, as soon as the particle pass through this uh, uh, peak of the potential, um, you have this burst of radiation here, and then uh, the source is in fact uh, exponentially suppressed, and you don't get any more the radiation from the source. What you get in fact are the ring down modes of Schwarzschild, okay, as soon as the particle pass through the peak here. And in fact, I took here a sentence that was written in the paper saying that part of the energy produced in this strong burst is stored in the resonant cavity of the geometry, so around, uh, inside the barrier, and then slowly released in ring down modes. And we will see that there is some analogy with what now numerical simulation for comparable mass black holes are showing. So just to tell you something more about the, the, uh, what are these ring down modes of the black hole, that was, was realized that, um, again in the 70s uh, uh, through the work of many people here, uh, that um, a black hole in fact is like uh, a bell. If you have some proper uh, uh, frequency, normal modes, actually they are quasi normal because these are complex frequencies with a decay time, so these are damp sinusoids. And so if you take, for example, this equation and you put the source time to zero and you impose a boundary condition, no incoming radiation, so something that goes outside, outgoing, when you go far from the, from the black hole and is uh, ingoing if you go toward the horizon, you find that this equation uh, gives you some uh, um, discretized frequency that are complex. And... Uh, um, this frequency is, uh, is quite interesting also that uh, the real part of this frequency uh, it's, um, it can be well approximated by the square root of the potential here. Because in fact, as soon as omega square becomes of the order of this uh, potential at the peak, uh, you basically, this uh, radiation can be emitted, okay? And part of it goes outside and part of it goes inside. And quite interestingly, the peak of this potential is at this 3M, and 3M is the position of the last unstable orbit for a photon in Schwarzschild, which is so-called also the light ring okay, of Schwarzschild. And uh, uh, in fact, this uh, frequency here, L divided by square root of 27, is the one that was giving this uh, wavelength, okay, the tail part of this waveform here. So basically, as soon as uh, uh, you have a perturbation which has uh, a, uh, uh, a frequency which is of the order of the uh, light ring frequency, by resonance you can excite this quasi-normal mode. And another uh, important, uh, I think, uh, another important step uh, or uh, analytic uh, development 
again to try to understand this last part of the uh, evolution of two black holes came from uh, this approximation that was introduced by Price and Poole in 94 close the, called the, the close limit approximation in which they were saying okay so as soon as you arrive very close uh, after this long spiral for example you arrive very close to uh, the uh, common apparent horizon or the light ring of the system at that point you can switch from a two body description to the one body description and you can just use perturbation theory to describe the waveform from that point on and in this plot uh, which is taken from uh, this paper uh, I'm showing in fact a comparison be between numerical results for a, a head-on collision full numerical results and the perturbation theory first order or uh, even up to second order and you see the agreement is quite good for this last part of the waveform okay and on the other side this is for head-on collision there, there was the result in 2001 by the Lazarus, uh, Lazarus uh, group Baker, Brookman, Campanelli and Lusto which were applying the same philosophy they were saying okay let's solve the full numerical uh, uh, let's do a full numerical evolution for a very short time and then we attach immediately perturbation theory to describe the ending part and they were finding this result for the merger ring down which is actually in uh, blue here, the Lazarus, contrasted today with the merger waveform that we obtain in numerical relativity. Okay? So all this was saying that, that uh, there is uh, some kind of... Uh, um, so the, the last part of the evolution, in fact, can be uh, easily matched to, uh, perturb uh, to a perturbed black hole. Okay? okay, so I started actually from the end. Now let's go back. And uh, let's consider what happens before that and which analytical models have been developed to describe the long spiral. So here the method that has been, uh, uh, um, that, uh, has been quite successful is the method based on post newtonian theory. So we know that in general relativity, radiation reaction effects, they appear at the order V to the 5, C to the 5, beyond the Newtonian force law. And throughout the spiral, and by the way, I'm going to consider only uh, orbits that are quasi-circular, okay? So I'm not going to uh, introduce any eccentricity in the orbit because uh, the focus here is more on waveform that are of interest for LIGO, for which we know that for that mass range, the orbit is going to be uh, circularized. So throughout the spiral, the radiation reaction time scale is much larger than the orbital time scale. And there is a natural adiabatic parameter, which is this omega dot divided by omega square, where omega is the orbital frequency. So the leading correction to this uh, is V to the phi, C to the phi. So this quantity is quite small all along the spiral. And then you can have correction that goes like 1 over C. Now, when you apply the post-Newtonian uh, expansion, what you do is that you do an expansion in V over C, which uh, through the virial theorem is also GM divided by C square R. R is the relative distance between the two bodies. And because we have uh, compact bodies like neutron star and black holes, uh, actually this is also the compactness parameter divided by R, which is going to be also small. So this is going to be an expansion in V over C, but also in G. Uh, so now um, the talk is going to uh, focus more on this transition between the last cycles of the evolution, the merger and the ring down. Uh, but I want to tell you, because I will do some comparison also, uh, how we compute uh, the waveforms for this very long uh, adiabatic and spiral phase. So without putting any indices here, because it's very symbolic, H, the gravitational field, is uh, two times derivatives, the quadrupole moment of the source. And uh, this quadrupole moment, uh, at leading order, because the quadrupole is xi, xj, minus uh, one half x squ squared delta ij, you take two time derivatives, you get uh, an acceleration and velocity, then you replace the acceleration with the velocity, and you obtain something that goes like v squared over c squared. And then you have the cosine of 2 phi, where phi is the orbital phase. At Newtonian level, v square is omega to the 2 thirds. So at, linear, at the leading order, this scales like omega to the power 2 thirds. Now, for detection, what we care really is the phase evolution, because we want to match it very, very well. 
And so in order to get the phase at a higher post Newtonian order possible, we use the energy balance equation to compute the phase. So what we say is that the energy, the center of mass energy of the system, uh, the, the variation of the energy of the system is going to be equal to the gravitational wave energy flux. These two quantities are known as the post-Newtonian expansion in V over C. And so uh, if you rewrite this equation as dE over d omega, d omega over dt, you get this equation here. And now you know this as an expansion, and so you can get a very good representation of omega dot. You integrate it, and you get the phase. So this is the way in which we compute uh, templates. We extract the phase from all this at very high post-Newtonian order. We plug it here, and we get the template, HT. However, this way of doing uh, the, uh, the calculation has some assumption. The first one is that you are assuming a quasi-circular orbit uh, evolution, adiabatic evolution. And in principle, when, you are very when the two black holes are very close, uh, this assumption is going to become less and less accurate because you have to also include the radial velocity okay, in the system. Moreover, in principle, this equation should be used only up to the position of the last stable orbit, which is the minimum of the energy of the system. Uh, so in order to improve, uh, hopefully, in order to improve the uh, post-Newtonian accuracy until the end of the evolution, uh, so people have tried to resum, okay, to do a resummation of the energy and the flux. In post, uh, taking the post-Newtonian expression and resumming it. So I want to spend a few slides, because we are going to use it later, uh, about this resummation technique that was introduced by Thibaut Amour and myself in 99. So in here, the idea is the following. So at the time in which this, uh, this approximation was introduced, we actually didn't have the numerical relativity results. So we didn't know to what this, uh, uh, so we didn't know what was this energy for comparable mass, the exact expression, and what was the flux. So we, we uh, made a, a number of assumptions. The first assumption is um, we assume that the equal mass case, the comparable mass case, is just a smooth deformation of the test mass limit where the deformation parameter is this parameter eta, which is the symmetric mass um, between the two, is m1, m2 divided by m squared. So eta is zero in the test mass limit, it's one fourth, it doesn't vary much, this eta, okay? Uh, the second idea was, okay, we have to do this resummation in a coordinate invariant manner, to make sense. And so we used, because um, in classical uh, gravity you can use the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism to compute if you have, for example, what we call the real description in which you have the two bodies that move uh, and they exchange gravitons, the dynamics can be expressed in a um, coordinate invariant manner by computing the energy of the bound states of this uh, um, system here as a function of the adiabatic invariance J and N. J is the angular momentum, N is the combination of the radial adiabatic invariant and the angular momentum. It's not so important. Uh, um, so you can do this coordinate invariant uh, um, uh, description using the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, formalism. And then what we did was to map these two body description in a one body description in which you have a test body that goes uh, that moves in a suitable Schwarzschild spacetime will be a deformed spa Schwarzschild spacetime with deformation parameter eta. And also in this description, you can introduce, uh, you can compute the energy as a function of the adiabatic invariance. And all the game is to relate these two energies, obtaining a new energy which uh, we think it's more uh, accurate than the energy that you obtain here. So I'm not going to show you any uh, the details of the calculation, but I want to tell you what were the rules that we adopt to do the mapping. So we assume that the test particle here has the mass equal to the reduced mass of the system. The total mass is equal to the total mass in this Schwarzschild. Uh, the total mass of the system is the mass in Schwarzschild. We identify the adiabatic invariance in the two description, but we allow the energy function to be 
different between E effective and E real. So you can write E effective as an expansion in 1 over C square, and you can determine these are known parameter alpha 1 and alpha 2 by uh, mapping the two descriptions. And the result was very simple. Uh, in fact, even working until 3 p.m., which is the higher order correction here, we found that uh, only alpha 2 is different from 0, and so the non-relativistic effective energy between uh, effective energy and real energy are related by this very simple function here. And uh, okay, uh, we, we actually tried different mapping, but at the end, this one was uh, the one that uh, we thought uh, for different reasons, uh, including uh, an interesting uh, um, analogy um, with what was found in quantum electrodynamics. So if you express E real as a function of E effective, you find that there is this relation between E effective and E real. And uh, in the 70s, those people were trying to, find, to, to look at the same problem in quantum electrodynamics when you ask the question, what is the, the energy of uh, a system made of two charges that can have comparable masses, like, for example, the positronium system, mu plus mu minus, okay? Uh, you cannot use, uh, I mean, this system is very dif is different from uh, the hydrogen atom because uh, the two masses can be comparable. So, uh, resumming uh, in the iconal approximation some Feynman diagrams, they were finding uh, the same kind of mapping between the effective energy, which now is the, the energy of a particle in, uh, of a charged particle in uh, uh, Coulomb potential, and the real energy. So also guided, uh, I mean, the fact that we were finding this analogy using completely different methods was in some sense suggesting that maybe we were on the right, uh, right uh, description. Okay. So the last, uh, I think, uh, trans uh, transparency is on, on the UB, just to summarize what is all this uh, mapping. So you start from an Hamiltonian, which is post-Newtonian expanded in 1 over C squared. I show you only here the first terms. You go into this effective description when you have a new metric, which is a deformed Schwarzschild metric. The deformation parameter is eta. And then you go back, and the new Hamiltonian, uh, which is exactly this, uh, what I wrote it here, is the square root of 1 plus 2 eta of this Hamiltonian in, uh, in the effective description. You can actually build a canonical transformation between the two descriptions. And what is quite, uh, is quite good, and we will see the advantage of that, is that uh, instead of having many, many terms, as you have originally in the post-Newtonian expanded form, all the dynamics is condensed in these two functions, A and D, in the metric. And, uh, Afterwards, people have also in, applied uh, another resummation, which is called the Padet resummation, to sometimes, uh, if you want to have, for example, that the horizon of the black hole is at 2m, or that uh, you have a light ring, or you have a lastable orbit, you can apply also the Padet resummation that allows to rewrite these terms in another form. Okay. So the conclusion of all this is that you have a new Hamiltonian, and now what, ah, okay, uh, actually I had these transparencies, I forgot. So just visually, to see what this uh, uh, resummation is doing, this is the binding energy as a function of the radial separation for the EOB approximant, 1 pn, 2 pn, 3 pn, and this is what you would obtain if you were not resumming it, okay? So uh, this, this explains a little bit the resummation, and also, although here you cannot see it very well, but actually the 3PN result is not very different from the 3PN result of the Taylor expanded form, and uh, this was not anticipated because when the mapping was done, the 3PN was not known, but it's a good news because it means that the 3PN, the two schemes, are quite close to each other. So now, this is for what concerns the conservative part of the dynamics, now, when you, what you want to do with respect to what I was explaining here, where you use just the adiabatic uh, formulation to compute the phase evolution, you want to, to go up to uh, the end, uh, including the plunge, etc. So you cannot just uh, have one degree of freedom, which is the frequency evolution. So with the new Hamiltonian, you can write down uh, uh, the Hamilton equations with an appropriate radiation reaction force that we work out, and you can solve these equations. And what we learn from all this? Okay, so with this new system of, of equation that uh, um, 
we thought uh, were uh, giving, uh, were, could provide a dynamics that could be trusted uh, almost until uh, uh, the merger. Uh, you can solve those, those Hamilton equations and you get, uh, for example, in the equal mass case, these are the trajectories up to the last stable orbit, and then at the end you have the plunge, which is this part here. The second important ingredient in this scheme is that the transition merger to ring down was assumed very short. And this was uh, inspired by the results that I showed you at the beginning of this uh, talk from the 70s, when people were finding that, uh, uh, if you want, as soon as uh, you pass this uh, peak of the curvature potential, you immediately trigger the production of the ring down modes. And so the waveform, we arrive at the end of the plunge, and we attach immediately the ring down modes. Now, to attach the ring down modes, you need to know the final spin and mass of the black hole that at that time were not known because we didn't have the results from numerical relativity. And so we computed the energy and the spin of the black hole at the end of the plunge by the angular momentum at the light ring divided by the energy square. And for example, for the spin, we were obtaining 0.77, which is not very far. It's 10% of the result of numerical relativity, which says that is 0 0.7, 0 0.69. And, the ener and re remember also that this is computed at the end of the plunge which does not include the, the radiation emitted during the ring down. So it has to be a little bit larger. OK, so now I show you some results from numerical relativity, and we will try then to do some uh, comparison. So the first, uh, as uh, I think all of you now know, uh, since two years, um, we have, uh, so numerical relativity had uh, several breakthrough with uh, now several groups being able to really do the, evolve the system for uh, many cycles through uh, merger and ring down. And uh, here I'm going to show you some results that today can be considered a bit old. These are one year ago. Uh, <laughs> but the, f the field is uh, going very fast. But uh, I, I want to show some of them because they were the first they analyzed, and I think one can understand many things, even if there is some eccentricity, inaccuracy, etc. So these are two black holes that are spiraling in from the numerical simulation of Franz Pretorius um, using the initial condition from Cook and Pfeiffer. And uh, the two black holes uh, go toward uh, something like 4.5 orbits, so eight gravitational wave cycles. And then uh, this is the uh, common apparent horizon, quite distorted. Uh, in black, actually, there is also the estimation of the light ring of the final black hole. And uh, uh, the first thing that appeared that was quite interesting to see was uh, this adiabaticity of the evolution. In the sense, uh, this is an equal mass binary, and the motion is quite adiabatic, or circular, until the end you almost don't see a plunge, in fact. The plunge is very blurred. And in this plot, uh, computing, uh, uh, using the numerical relativity results, uh, um, we computed R dot divided by omega R. R dot is the radial velocity, omega R is the tangential velocity. There are these uh, bumps that are due to the eccentricity in the simulations. But never mind, you see that uh, R dot is uh, quite small with respect to the tangential velocity. And it's even 10% of it when you are at 25 m before the common, um, common apparent horizon formation, so almost up to the end. And quite a, uh, this is quite amusing. Uh, you can compute R dot divided by omega R using uh, the leading uh, radiation reaction effect in R dot, which is minus 16 over 5 m divided by R 5 over 2. You can plot here the curve, and uh, besides gauge effects and coordinate uh, dependence, this curve averaged quite well the numerical relativity uh, results. So this is quite, uh, is really showing that anyway, the motion is quite adiabatic until the end. Uh, since uh, I'm going to show you some plots also of the waveform, uh, so many of you are familiar with H plus and H cross. But in numerical relativity, people extract the Newman Penrose variable psi 4, which is the second derivative of H plus and H cross. And uh, uh, instead of actually dealing with psi 4, which depends on the point on the sphere, 
uh, we generally decompose in uh, spin weight minus two spherical harmonics, and we, in fact, uh, basically work with the CLM, minus two CLM, okay? And uh, when you consider comparable mass, actually the L equal to M equal to mode will be the one that mo most dominate. And by the way, at leading order in uh, post-Newtonian expansion, this C22 is omega to a certain power, A divided by 3, and then uh, E to the 2 phi, okay? Here, minus plus 2 phi, depending if it is L of M. Okay, so now, the first, uh, another interesting uh, uh, results of this numerical simulation is that, uh, uh, again, for equal mass... Call has been terminated. Please contact your moderator and verify the time and date of your conference call. So we have to wait for... Um, is that uh, this picture actually is going to change when I, I'm going to show you results for the non-equal mass binary. Uh, for equal mass binary, um, there is one dominant frequency, in fact, in the problem. Uh, basically, um, the one associated with the C22 mode. And um, you can compute it, uh, for example, from the coordinate separation, um, because you can compute uh, the center of the, uh, of the apparent horizon of the two uh, black holes, and from that you can extract uh, the frequency that comes from the coordinate separation. But uh, if you consider, for example, this relation here, you see, if you take, uh, you compute the, phi, uh, the frequency from the wave, you can just uh, take uh, the derivative of C22 divided by C22 and take the imaginary part, and this is going to be the frequency of your gravitational wave, in fact. And if you plot them, the black and the red line, they are, and you shift because you have to take into account uh, the retarded time, uh, after this pulse, initial pulse, which is due to the fact that the two bodies are not uh, exactly on an in-spiraling at the beginning, uh, actually the system settles down and they are quite close to each other uh, until uh, uh, some point when actually you don't see it very well here, but they start differing more and more as the two bodies reach uh, the peak of the, uh, uh, actually the zero here, the dash line here is the common apparent horizon position, and then the frequency rises and then goes to a constant, and the constant value is the ring down, uh, the ring down mode, the quasi normal, uh, the fundamental mode of, uh, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, mode, uh, ring down modes of the L equal to M equal to mode. So the frequency evolution is quite simple. These bumps, again, are just due to eccentricity that were present in the data. Uh, now, we try to understand uh, the last part of the evolution when, uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this frequency, uh, the frequency evolution is no longer adiabatic during this phase here, and the ring-down modes are produced. And uh, to understand when the ring-down modes are produced, Actually, this is a little bit ambiguous, but uh, we, we try to understand where in time this happens. I should say that uh, the, the answer is not uh, uh, yet definitive, uh, but uh, we had an, a qualitative idea of that. And uh, there have been also, I'm going to present results from this paper, there have been also results from a paper by Berti and collaborators. Uh, so what we did was to take the waveform and uh, fit, uh, extract, or subtract if you want, the quasi-normal mode. And this quasi-normal mode for L equal to M equal to are the fundamental and then the higher overtones. So we first extracted the, the fundamental ones, which is in red here, contrasted with the full waveforms, and then the first overtone, the second one, and the third one. And in dashed line you see the residual. And then uh, once uh, we extracted the ring down modes, we reconstruct the frequency associated to it, and we show that this uh, it is a good representation of the frequency of the wave until a certain point here, which is the peak in the waveform. On the other hand, you have uh, the frequency from the coordinate and the frequency from the full waveform. So we said in that uh, basically we concluded from that that the ring down modes are more or less excited once you are close to the peak of the waveform, okay, which is uh, maybe 5m after the common apparent horizon is formed. 
and uh, um, there are we identified as the merger uh, the region that goes from the point in which the coordinate uh, the frequency from the coordinate separate from the frequency from the wave and when the ring down modes are excited it's a very short uh, in fact phase it lasts maybe for 10 15 m and uh, this plot is actually uh, interesting because we have here identified some events during the evolution again this is the frequency and this is the uh, flux of energy multiplied by 100 um, so if you want to see how much energy is released all along the evolution you have to keep in mind that uh, um, the energy release depends also, the absolute value depends on uh, where you start your simulation. Also, how much angular momentum is released depends what is the angular momentum at the beginning, okay? So, when you arrive uh, at uh, um, almost uh, the common apparent horizon formation, 50% of the total energy that the system is going to radiate, which is around 3.5% of M, has yet to be radiated, okay? When you arrive at the peak of the energy flux, 67% of the energy has yet to be radiated, and 85% of the angular momentum. So this merger phase, which lasts, which is very short, 10-15 M, is nevertheless quite energetic because it's a phase in which the frequency is increasing very fastly, okay, until it settles down here. Okay, so uh, now I'm, I will try to explain in the next, uh, uh, I think, 10 minutes, um, how we can use what we understood of these different phase uh, to work out some uh, uh, or to improve uh, existing templates uh, that can include also part of this uh, last stage of in spiral and even the merger and the ring down. And here I want to underline the fact that there are two separate issues. Uh, if you want, uh, you can uh, allow, for example, uh, mild systematics in your templates if you, want just, if you are just interested to detection. Okay? Uh, sometimes in the literature we call uh, these templates effective. But you have to require very low systematics if you want to extract uh, binary parameters. And again here there is a distinction if you want to uh, test astrophysics or general relativity because in general relativity you really require very good uh, uh, estimation of parameters but if you want to test astrophysics generally 10%, 1% is already uh, good enough okay, in the estimation of parameters uh, ok so the first uh, um, uh, the first actually templates I'm going to describe are the one in which we don't require them to be very faithful but they are very interesting because they could be used for detection and to do that you have to keep in mind now the following thing when you look at the waveforms, um, the waveform has an in spiral, a merger, and ring down. And uh, if you really want to understand uh, um, uh, um, which, uh, which part uh, uh, of it will contribute most, you have to, um, this is actually quite done in the literature, you have to build what is called the whitened uh, waveform. You take the waveform, you divide by the noise spectral density of your detector. And so, for example, if you have a, a very low mass binary, um, uh, these lines here represent, if you are on the right of it, 10% of the signal to noise ratio is built in this part, 20% in this part, 30% in this part. And you see here, as you increase the mass of the system, still keeping equal mass, you will be more and more sensitive to the merger part. If you take a 50 plus 50 binary, uh, all the signal to noise ratio is built during the last, uh, uh, during the merger and the ring down. Uh, what, what noise are you using? LIGO. Initial LIGO. LIGO. Uh, okay, so now let's, uh, uh, I want to show you in fact this comparison with uh, numerical relativity and uh, some uh, templates that actually are um, used in LIGO at the moment or can be even improved a little bit with some adjustments. So this is again equal mass case, although this work has been done also for some unequal masses. This is work done in collaboration with Yipan, who is postdoc in my group, and Pretorius and NASA Goddard. And 
let's uh, focus on first on this plot, which has a total mass of 30. This has a total mass of 100. So what is plotted here is uh, we take the numerical relativity waveform, and we take the Fourier transform, and we build the phase and the amplitude. So the amplitude is going like f to the minus 7 over 6, and then as this bump that is due to the ring down merger. In fact, the, the, this frequency here is mo more or less the quasi-normal mode frequency of the fundamental mode. Okay? Now, we take the numerical relativity waveform and we match with some templates. And uh, we maximize on time of arrival, initial phase, and also masses, also the masses. And uh, because this is a 15 plus 15, uh, the part of the, uh, the phase which is... Uh, where the matching is best is actually uh, in this region here because as I told you when you take a 15 plus 15 actually the last part of the, uh, the evolution is important the merger is less important and the ring down is less important and in fact you see the best matching that the, me the best phase matching is in this region here not in this region here okay and you can uh, uh, Already, if you use, for example, the stationary phase approximation templates, for which the phase is uh, given as an expansion in uh, post-Newtonian order in, in V, at 3.5 pn, you get matching that are of the order of 0.98, okay? Fitting factor, sorry, fitting factor. You can, uh, uh, well, actually, for the SPA at 3.5 pn, the matching is not 0.98, it's a little bit, it's 0.9495. But you can improve it either going to uh, a physical region of the parameter space or by introducing a 4 pn term which is fitted to the numerical relativity result. And by just by doing that, you can get a very good agreement, not only for system of total mass 30, but even for 100, where you will be much more sensitive to the merger part. In fact, you see here that the, the phase, uh, as the, the matching of the phase is best in this region here, where you, are, you, you will be sensitive, in fact, to the merger part. And uh, you see also here plotted the EOB waveform in green, where the EOB has also the ring down part, and you see, in fact, this uh, shape here that can uh, uh, recover the numerical relativity results for the uh, amplitude and also for the phase, okay? If you go back in the time domain and you take the SPA, actually this is the plot that comes from the matching for a 30 solar mass and 100 solar mass. So in general, we obtain, in fact, fitting factors that are larger than 0.97, maximizing on binary parameters time of arrival initial phase. So this is quite, uh, quite good already. Uh, if you consider the case of the fatty one body, again, you can obtain very high fitting factor, but... Uh, um, here I'm showing you results in which we don't maximize on the masses of the binary, but just initial phase and time of arrival. And uh, this was a first cut to the problem done in this paper with uh, Greg Cook and Pretorius, where you see plotted uh, the numerical relativity frequency going up and the EOB frequency, the spiral merger and ring down. The difference here, the, 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 um, the, the biggest difference is the fact that uh, the rate of the frequency is a little bit too sharp in the, in the fatty one body, and this causes here some differences also in the amplitude. But what was also interesting is that uh, as soon as you arrive at this point and you attach three quasi-normal mode, you can reproduce the ring down part of the waveform quite well, in fact. But we want to do better than this because we would like to use uh, a model for the merger ring down and the last stage of in spiral not maximizing on the binary parameter to get something which is faithful. And so we work out this uh, uh, more in detail. Actually, I forgot I have also these slides. Um, <laughs> it came out. Uh, this was concluding, actually, the effective templates. Uh, this is just that if you now use these templates uh, and you build a signal-to-noise ratio, for example, at 100 megaparsec, as a function of the total mass of the system for LIGO and enhanced LIGO, uh, so if you stop at uh, the Schwarzschild ISCO, you obtain something of the order of uh, 6, okay, for a total mass of 40. But because of this uh, very energetic uh, uh, phase of the merger ring down, you can bring in band 
masses that are much higher than uh, 30 or 40 if you have a template that can reproduce the merger ring down. And so the, the blue cards here are the numerical relativity uh, uh, template, if you want, and uh, the dashed are either the station of his approximation extended the little bit or the EOB, okay? So with a very small loss in signal-to-noise ratio, if you include it. Okay, but we want to, de to be more precise now, and uh, we did recently uh, in this paper with, uh, again, Nasa Goddard and Yipan, some other adjustments. And the adjustments are because we want to improve uh, this problem here of the frequency, which is increasing too fastly. And uh, you remember that I, went, I was introducing the effective uh, one-body metric. I introduced this parameter A in the metric. And this parameter A is known up to 3 pn, uh, but we added a 4 pn term, and uh, we fix this parameter lambda by fitting to the numerical relativity result. And why this parameter is important, this fu function is important? Because if you compute the, the exact frequency evolution, the frequency evolution is just uh, AR divided by R squared plus a quantity here, which actually is, turns out to be constant during the plunge. So what I'm saying is that uh, um, during the in-spiral, you have a certain frequency evolution. And I'm interested in this last part here, before you arrive at uh, the light ring position. And uh, what I'm saying is that as soon as you pass uh, the last stable orbit of the system, the angular momentum and the energy are going to be constant almost because you are a long geodesic. So this quantity is a constant. And AR over R square is just the radial potential for a massless particle in Schwarzschild. The maximum of it is going to be the light ring. And uh, in fact, here you see the omega exact and the omega from the plunge, the analytic expression, and they are very close to each other. So if you want to change this shape, the one that was rising too sharply, you need to modify this quantity, AR, okay? That you have to modify because uh, AR cannot be just the 3PN expression. It will have all higher order corrections. So we just try to add, in a phenomenological way, a 4PN correction to it. And so, for example, this is the position of the peak of AR divided by R squared, which will be the position of the, light, uh, of the light ring of the system. And then once we arrive at the light ring, we can attach immediately the ring down modes. And in fact, we work out an analytic uh, expression for the matching frequency as a function of the um, symmetric mass ratio. And then what you need is the spin and the mass of the final black hole to get the quasi-normal modes. And this we did some fits to a sparse number of numerical relativity results for the mass and the spin as a function of the symmetric mass ratio. And so this model, for example, once you fix lambda, is basically, uh, as no parameter, you, you fix lambda by fitting to the numerical results, and we found 60. And then you have the matching point where you attach the ring down, you know these values, and you have the complete waveform. And uh, these are the results. So this is the improvement for the evolution of the frequency in this plot. And this is the waveform up to here I blow up to see also the last part of it. And we got a phase difference in gravitational wave cycles from the beginning, which was 15 cycles up to the end, of something like 5% of a cycle, which is uh, already quite good and can be improved uh, even further. But, um, now, until now, I've, I've been showing you results for equal mass. What happens when you consider different mass ratios? Yes. Okay, so actually, uh, I will show you in a moment because I have some comparison with the extremely accurate uh, results from. Uh, from Caltech Cornell now, uh, but um, uh, the fact is that um, if, you, if you put uh, more cycles at the beginning, you are going to get a defacing, okay? Uh, so for example, here I'm using 15 cycles. If you have 30 cycles, there will be a, a defacing that builds up. And uh, uh, however, if you, um, if you 
basically compare this waveform at the peak of the, of the, of, of the waveform and not at the beginning, you shift all this defacing at, uh, at the very beginning. And you can, uh, by changing this lambda parameter, you can try to match that part also and try to match the beginning. But uh, uh, to answer your question, here there is an error, which is of the order of this 5% that I plotted here. But uh, I think what I want to, the point I want to make here is that uh, you have some flexibility in this model in order to adjust uh, to the numerical relativity results. But this is not a definite uh, answer to the problem because as you will see in a moment, this lambda has to be different if I want to match the Caltech or net values, okay? But it's just a way of showing you how to, you can improve this uh, accuracy here. But it's not at all the end of the story, in fact. Uh, now, when you consider different mass ratio, you include, uh, you, you can, uh, um, uh, in principle, you, are, you, you complicate the problem because now you have different frequencies. You don't have only the dominant two to one, However, these frequencies uh, are multiple to one to the other if you are doing the spiral because they will be just uh, different harmonics, okay? But uh, the, the simulation are also saying that at some point uh, they decouple to each other and the point in which they decouple, uh, in fact, uh, it depends on the mass ratio and uh, uh, the simple uh, way of uh, matching to the ring down, for example, that we are using in the fatty one body, uh, could fail a little bit here because uh, for different harmonics you have to match at different points, okay? But uh, uh, when you have different mass ratio, it's true that the different harmonics are important, but not all of them are so important. For example, mass ratio 4-1, the 2-2 two -two is still the dominant, the next one will be the 3-3, three -three, and then you have the 2-1 and the 4-4, four -four, etc. So for example, this way of matching with the pseudo 4PN term allows to get a very good matching also of the 3-3, three -three, which is showed here. And uh, when you put the different harmonics together, this is the waveform that you get and with different harmonics that you can see it. And the defacing, for example, is of the order of 8%, okay? But uh, you obtain this result despite the fact that uh, Actually, you don't match so well other harmonics like the 4-4 four four or the 2-1, okay? uh, where the ring down part is not well matched. And also here you see the frequency evolution is a little bit uh, out. Okay? But because these two are two dominant harmonics, when you build the all, the all the signal and you, for example, look at an inclination angle of pi over 3, which was this example, you still can get a very good matching. But the model has to be improved to, uh, because with mass ratio 1.6, it will be even more important, the contribution of the subdominant mode. So uh, I don't have time to show you this, but uh, I want to show you, in fact, something. Uh, well, I didn't match directly the numerical relativity results of Caltech Cornell, but because they show that there is one approximant, which is called the T4 approximant of post-Newtonian theory, which approximates quite well the numerical relativity waveform. We, last week, actually, with Lipan, we took that approximant and we tried to match to the UB to see the difference in phase. So we started with a frequency of 0.016, an orbital frequency. We went on for 30 cycles. Uh, we matched the, the post-Newtonian and the EOB at 0 0.02, which was one of the values chosen by uh, this recent result from Caltech Cornell. And this is the defacing at the end when I look at uh, what happens between two waveforms at 0 0.05 after 30 cycles. And uh, actually, it's better represented here where I have the frequency evolution at this 0 0.05 between the T4 which approximate with a difference of 0.05 radians the numerical relativity results of Caltech Cornell, and the EOB at 3.5, the pseudo uh, EOB at, uh, with lambda parameter 60. And now, uh, in order to get uh, a very small difference with the T4, I actually have to choose lambda equal to 10. So this difference is the accumulated uh, phase difference that uh, happens during the 30 cycle between 
for example, the Caltech Cornell, I think, uh, uh, waveform and uh, uh, what you will get from a finite different code that uh, with 4 pn, 4 uh, order convergence, for example, that will be some difference of phase that will accumulate. And this explains why uh, the parameter lambda has to be different in the two cases. Actually, we did also this game of uh, going beyond it, and <laughs> uh, this is just an example. But uh, the EOB model with lambda equal to 10, which match with uh, 0.01 radian the T4, which is close to the caltech Cornell waveform, if we go beyond it and we apply the procedure of matching to the ring down, this will be the waveform beyond the point, uh, point 0.05 in frequency. So after three cycles, you should see the merger, and then you have the ring down part. Uh, of course, this is just an example. But this is what is showing is also an interesting difference between the T4 and the EOB, which will be interesting to see if it really happens, uh, if the numerical relativity results is going to follow this line here or is going to follow this line here. OK? Eh? Or neither of the two. Yeah. OK, so uh, I actually had. Um, well, besides this transparency that was more to show you that there is a lot of work to do when you put the spin in the game, because uh, the different approximants are going to be very different when you put the spin. And this is due to the fact that the spin is not known at high post-Newtonian order. It's not known at 2, 3 pn, 3.5. It's known uh, at 2.5 pn, for example. And when you go from 1.5 pn to 2.5 pn, you can have a difference of 200 n in, uh, in uh, between the different models. Even between the EOB and uh, the non-EOB models, you can have differences of 200 M if you after 20 cycles. So in the non-spinning case, these models are quite close. Some, well, uh, it depends. So, some people think that maybe half a radiance is not so close, but uh, anyway, so they are quite close. But here they will be very different. And it's just due to the fact that we lack, uh, in fact, uh, the calculation of a spin effect at higher order. So there will be work to do in, in the future. So now, I had actually four transparencies on the recoil. And uh, I don't know if uh, I can go, I can explain you this, because it's almost, uh, it's five, actually. Or if you want to hear this, I can go through this. It's just 10 minutes. Uh, it's OK? Everybody is uh, maybe not uh, is already. I would, I would like to hear it, but Michaela is the boss. Uh, how many questions do people have on, on the rest? Uh, yeah, so I have a question about the uh, She's here all week for questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> also, after the talk, you can ask me. So I think, OK, so the other interesting application of uh, trying to, uh, of the interface between analytic and numerical uh, relativity, I think it's uh, the computation of the gravitational recoil. So what is this recoil velocity? If you have a binary with some asymmetry due to the mass difference or the presence of the spin, uh, the center of mass of the system is going to build, uh, is going to acquire a velocity. And this velocity, because of the conservation of the momentum of the system, is going to be given to the final black hole. So the final black hole is going to have a kick uh, or recoil velocity. And this recoil velocity is quite important in astrophysics because uh, if it is too high, the black hole can be ejected from the galaxy. And then uh, it could change uh, the way in which uh, uh, black holes uh, grow in uh, the mass of the black hole. Uh, how uh, black holes can grow in mass, OK? Because if it is ejected, then uh, you, uh, I mean, the way in which they grow will be very different. And we know that uh, there are very big black holes at the center of the galaxies, in almost all galaxies. So uh, the linear momentum flux, before I was describing the energy flux. So there is also a linear momentum flux due to this emission. Uh, and um, this actually, oh, the leading term is at higher order with respect to the energy flux. It's 1 over c to the 7. It's a 3.5 pn effect counted in this way. And uh, it, the effect is due to the beating of some modes. And um, 
uh, you have a couple of modes, in fact, here. For example, uh, actually the leading term, if you don't have even spin, is the beating between the mass quadrupole and the mass octopole, or you have the mass quadrupole and the current quadrupole, or this other term here. So even before numerical relativity results, people have computed uh, this formula in post-Newtonian theory. Then the integral in time of this formula gives you the recoil, no? because this is the linear momentum flux. And it turns out that uh, un for a good part of the spiral, maybe 100 m before the common apparent horizon, the formula, the formula derived in post-Newtonian theory worked quite consistently. But if we want to get the final uh, recoil, what is very important is to model the merger and ring down transition, as you will see in a moment. And actually, the importance of this phase was pointed out in this paper by Lamour and Gopakuma, where they used, in fact, again, the EOB approach to, to estimate the recoil from uh, unequal mass binaries. In the literature, uh, people recently, people in the numerical relativity community, have been using a phenomenological formula that can be derived from post-Newtonian theory using the results of this paper by Larry Kidder. So forget about this term here in red. If, the, if Q, which is the mass ratio, is 1, you don't have any kick, as I said, because uh, the mass are equal. There is no asymmetry in the problem. So you can create the, the asymmetry either because Q is different from 1 or because you have some spin. And the spins can produce a kick, which is either on the plane or actually outside the plane, so the non-planar part. And this depends on the orientation of the spin, on the angle between the spin and the orbital angular momentum, the angle of the spin with the radial separation vector. And this formula actually should be applied only during the spiral and, if you want, uh, maybe at the end of the plunge, but not beyond that point because of the ring down phase. So a lot of uh, interest, uh, um, actually, in, in the community was raised in the last uh, uh, months because people found very large kicks for some particular spin configuration for equal mass binaries, kick of the order of 2,000 kilometers per second, which, which will be higher than any escape velocity in any galaxy. Okay? And so this comes out in a very particular configuration in which uh, the spins are on the orbital plane at the beginning, and the total spin is basically zero, and the binary goes around, and the final kick is outside the plane. So it was important to understand how generic are also these results. And to understand how generic they are, it will be very good to have a Monte Carlo simulation with some analytic models that can produce, I mean, that depends on the different parameters. So in view of that, we tried to, un to understand, we call it the anatomy of the kick, we try to understand how the kick builds up during the spiral merger and ring down. And this is a work done in collaboration with Jeremy Schnittman, who has been a postdoc in my group until September. And again, we, we used data from the NASA Goddard group. And uh, what you find is that depending on the mass ratio and the spin, you have a different zoology of configuration. This is the, uh, the recoil velocity in the plane Vx, Vy, Vx, Vy for two different binaries. Non-equal mass, mass ratio 2, 3, equal mass, but sp with spin. And the spin are aligned, anti-aligned with the angular momentum. So you see here something uh, uh, that was also quite known before. The, the velocity builds up. It goes uh, spiral out. And then when you arrive at the peak of the radiation, when the ring down starts, it can either spiral in again or it can continue to go down, uh, uh, outside. And uh, we identified that there are three main contributions to the recoil, which are the beating of these three pairs of modes, the 2, 2, 2, 1, etc., which are plotted here with different colors, in fact. And the reason why you get these different behaviors is precisely the ring down contribution. So for example, take this configuration, an, an equal mass, 2, 3, and uh, if you plot uh, the recoil velocity as a function of time, the total kick is in black here. It builds up, arrives to a maximum. Sometimes it can go down. This is the, called also the anti-kick. But sometimes it just flattens. And this is actually due to this different behavior that you see it here. And why does it happen? Well, it happens because if you decompose in ring down modes, 
Uh, and if you take the dominant uh, uh, pair of modes, which is the red one here, 2, 2, 3, 3, when you decompose in ring down modes, what counts here is the difference in frequency, in quasi-normal mode frequency, between the T3 and the 2, 2. And in this case, the difference in frequency is large, and so basically the system continues to spiral in, okay? While in this case, where the dominant mode is, pair of mode is 2, 1, 2, 2, actually the difference in frequency is small, and so the, uh, the, the blue line here, it just uh, uh, flattens, okay? Because the, the, the but basically it doesn't continue to oscillate, okay? It just flattens like that. And so by understanding and including in, a, in an accurate way the ring down part here, you can build some analytic model that can reproduce different configurations with mass ratio and spins. And uh, for example, uh, again in this paper with Jeremy, we computed, uh, we did a Monte Carlo using the EOB approach calibrated to take into account some uh, results of numerical relativity to compute, for example, how the kick is distributed as a function of the symmetric mass ratio for some random spin with this magnitude. And in particular, we found that uh, the fraction of binaries with a kick larger than 500 is of the order of 10% and larger than 1,000 is of the order of 3%, with quite large errors, in fact. And uh, in order to reduce these errors, we really need to have a better analytic model that can uh, uh, you know, match better the numerical relativity results. So here is, anyway, the conclusion. So the conclusion, I would say that uh, uh, there is this intriguing and uh, maybe anticipated, if we, if we think uh, at results in uh, uh, in the 70s that I was trying to explain at the beginning, simplicity of the binary coalescence, at least in the comparable mass case. Uh, in, the no spin, in the spinning case, uh, we don't have very accurate results until now, but what we have uh, uh, from numerical relativity is also showing kind of uh, simplicity, especially due to the fact that uh, when the bef just before the black hole forms, uh, J over M squared, in fact, is generally already less than 1. So you really don't need to, the system is, can immediately produce a black hole. There is no need of waiting and, you know, hanging up, etc. And uh, details of the merger seems to be hidden behind the curvature potential barrier. And in fact, it will be very interesting, I think, to dig out this curvature potential from the numerical simulations. This will allow to understand better also how the ring down modes are generated and, uh, and will help in, in, uh, in modeling uh, uh, analytically the problem. Uh, I try to show you the, uh, the fact that uh, by using resummation techniques, one can, first of all, condense the dynamics in a few functions that can be then adjusted. And uh, there is uh, flexibility to, be, uh, to really build waveforms for uh, full waveforms that contain also the merger and the ring down. And uh, I showed you some examples already that need to be further improved for many reasons because the numerical relativity um, waveform has to be more accurate, contain more cycles, extended to more uh, different mass ratios and also with spin. And then for the recoil, if you want really to get the final recoil, you cannot stop here at the end of the inspire, but you have to include the ring down part. And, uh, and we need also to improve the analytical modeling to reduce the uncertainty in the Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so that's... Uh... Okay. So no questions? Everybody wants to drink wine and eat cheese. <laughs> <laughs>